just like all my videos, this is a great video, so hit that subscribe button. I think I've earned it with that shameless display of arrogance and confidence. Anyway, today's video is about Dr. John Campbell, a retired nurse who's become a public figure on YouTube, amassing millions of subscribers and currently gaining over 140,000 views daily. Now, for any flat earther out there that's trying to count to 140,000, you've probably run out of fingers and toes by now. So let me just tell you that 140,000, you know, it's just a, a big number. Now, Dr. John Campbell might like to describe himself as a man who likes to follow the science and use evidence-based arguments. I analyse or try to analyse everything they say in context of underpinning physiology and underpinning principles and in terms of the data, the evidence. Now that's how some people might describe John Campbell, but I've also heard people describe him as somebody who simply prints off abstracts from scientific papers and then underlines random words while he reads them. Now, whatever you think of John Campbell, he's definitely a public figure and lots of people listen to him. That doesn't always go in his favour. For example, a couple of years ago, the BBC reported that his video was one of the contributing factors that helped spread misinformation about the number of people who died from Covid. Now, of course, Dr John Campbell is free to make his videos however he sees fit. After all, we all are. And that's, I suppose, how things like this end up on the internet. And if you don't know where you live, do you think you're ever going to know why you live there? That is a great question for sure. Really, really makes me think. And what is also a great question is how much time does John Campbell actually put in to research in his videos and research in his guests? You see, today we're going to take a look at one of his videos on a scientific paper that makes some absolutely extraordinary claims. And it is my opinion that perhaps he could have spent a little bit more time researching his video for this scientific paper. And he also maybe could or should have spent a little bit more time researching a guest he had on not so long ago. Do you know what? I, I live now only to testify in the court in Nuremberg. And you're a few decades too late for that. This is John O'Looney, who not too long ago was interviewed by John Campbell in a video that's now amassed over one and a half million views. Now, in that video, John Campbell seemed to treat uh, John O'Looney almost as if he was uh, an expert in his field. Now... It is my belief that if Dr. John Campbell had put just a little bit more research into John O'Looney, then he might have found things out which might have put that expert stance into question. For example, here's John O'Looney agreeing that the top politicians in the country are literally non-human entities. Well, you, you, you know, you've said a few things in the last 20 minutes, and one of those is that it sounds like you came to the conclusion, where well, you said the term they're not human because they have no humanity in them. But have you come to the conclusion that they're literally not human? I think um, at the very top of the, the tier, definitely. Here's John O'Looney telling over 60,000 people on Twitter that he's going to buy himself a UV torch because he wants to see whether vaccinated people illuminate under UV light. And here he is replying to himself, telling himself that if that is true, then maybe it's a great way to find out if politicians have been vaccinated. And here he is telling us that the new Ghostbusters film shows us the golden orbs of wisdom that fell from the tree of life, whatever the hell that means. And of course, it probably comes as no surprise to you to find out that John O'Looney initially denied COVID existed until he caught it and ended up in ICU. Now, recently, Dr. John Campbell has made a video that focuses on a scientific paper that makes some absolutely unbelievable claims. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they are the most bizarre claims that I have ever seen made in a YouTube video. And that is saying something, because I used to watch these two. Could clouds be made of salt? No, they couldn't. Anyway, let's be prepared to be amazed, like a flat earther might be, wondering where his feet have disappeared to when he puts his shoes on. This video is immense. Let's get rolling. Oh, and one last thing before we start, I really want to thank Commander Skinku uh, from Twitter for giving me the heads up on this video. I wouldn't have made this without him, so thank you so much. A warm welcome to this talk. It's Friday the 6th of September. Now, I've heard about this phenomena years ago, of course, but only just got some evidence to support it, so we can only just report on it now. OK, well, exciting new evidence for an amazing phenomenon that is, is known about for years. Uh, I cannot wait. We are going to have to, due to the YouTube algorithm, just dance around the language of this video a little bit. Uh, essentially, he tells us of a scientific paper which took a well-known medical intervention, beginning with a V, and they mixed it 
with some human cells, a variety of human cells, and incubated it. And what they saw was amazing. I'll let John take it from here. Incubated them to try and duplicate the conditions in the human body and the found nanostructures. Yes, this scientific paper says, in those medical interventions, beginning with a V, we can find nanostructures. Now, not just nanostructures, but a nanotechnology, a self-assembling nanotechnology. I know this sounds ludicrous, and of course it is. But John's going to tell us what the paper says anyway. Our observations suggest the presence of some kind of nanotechnology. Now, this is directly from peer-reviewed literature. Um... I don't expect you'll see it. I suspect strongly that I am currently uh, talking to myself in a back room in Carlisle somewhere. Um, um, if some of you do get to see it, then we consider that a bonus. You can think about it. But don't worry, John, the powers that be haven't taken down your video and it is there for us all to see. And we're going to see some clips now where John Campbell looks in wonder and awe at some of these bits of nanotechnology, like, like a flat earther might do, staring at the alphabet, wondering why all those letters have different shapes. Here we go. Now, these are from the publication. These are the, some of the nanostructures that were observed in... Uh, as I've said before, uh, conditions that were designed to duplicate human cells in the human body. So these are the sort of structures that we were finding. I mean, what the heck is that? You know, that, that is a structure that spontaneously um, sort of put itself together, a spontaneous assembly. So these spiral ones seem to come up. Again, spontaneously just put themselves together. Spontaneous sort of... <laughs> another spiral there. Um, there. Look at that. I mean, look at it. I mean, what is that? What are these things? Um, I mean, it's just, yeah. Uh, an explanation is clearly uh, required here. I would have thought. I would have thought. Let me know what you think. I mean, what is that? Spontaneously formed structure. Well, that one. Anyway, lots more examples in the uh, paper. Do uh, look at it for yourself and check it out. The, the paper is there and the pictures are all there. Yeah, don't worry, John, the paper's there and we will be checking those photographs out in a second. But firstly, I know what you guys at home are all laughing at right now because I'm laughing at the same thing as well. And if you're not laughing, you're clearly far more mature than I am. Ding dong. Now, uh, Dr. John Campbell doesn't seem to find this paper as amusing as I do. I don't know why. He is taking it quite seriously. This means the presence of these nanostructures needs to be explained by the manufacturers and by uh, international authorising agencies and national authorising agencies around the world. This is a peer-reviewed publication and I believe it gives questions to be answered. Yes, a peer-reviewed publication. We'll get to that later on, but of course, there are questions to be answered. So let's have a look at the images on this paper that show us this so-called self-assembling nanotechnology. Yes, and there they are, in their glory, a, a whole collection of completely unidentifiable, strange objects. Unidentifiable, of course, unless we do something really, really sophisticated like, I don't know, a, a Google search. Of course, such advanced research techniques aren't for the faint of hearted because, you know, they can take up to 20 seconds to perform. Anyway, we've snipped the first one, which is described as a beaded chain by the paper. We'll just drag and drop that into the uh, Google image search. It's all technical stuff, guys. Oh, and look what we see. We see that Google instantly shows us several images that look exactly like our mystery, totally unidentifiable object. And there we go, mystery object number one appears to be a bacteriophage, which is essentially a type of virus. What a mystery, Whew. Now let's identify this object here. The paper describes it as a floating filament shedding bubbles. And to get to the bottom of this unsolvable mystery, we need to know what type of microscope was used to take these pictures. Now here's the equipment that was actually uh, used here. Uh, it's stereo microscopes. Now basically all this means is you're looking at it in the two eyes, therefore you get stereoscopic vision. Brilliant, so let's do a Google search for microplastics seen under a stereo microscope. And here they are, our microplastics under a stereo microscope. 
And here's the images of self-assembling nanotechnology from the paper. Microplastics. Nanotechnology. Microplastics. Microplastics. Well, microplastics plus a bacteriophage. And given that a lot of these cultures were taken from saline solution, I'm willing to bet a fair few examples of salt crystals as well that have formed as the liquid has started to evaporate. Now, microplastics get everywhere. They take all kinds of shapes and sizes. So the question is, how did they get into the solution that was being tested in this paper? Now, to be fair to Dr. John Campbell, he never claimed in his video that he'd done any kind of research into what these images are. He was simply just presenting what the paper said. My personal preference would be for him to have done some research, and then maybe we wouldn't have to watch him sound so confused as he's reading the abstract of the paper. They were animated worm-like entities, disc chains, spirals, tubes, right-angled stru right structures. Right-angled structures containing other artifact, artifactual entities within them. Artifacts within artifacts. Anyway, let's see if we can't dig a little bit deeper into this mystery. Let's have a look at the journal this paper was taken from. It's a very interesting journal, the uh, International Journal of Vaccine Theory, Practice and Research. It's a couple of years old and it has already amassed an entire six editions. That's a hell of a backlog. I went to the very, very first edition to see what I could find. And in the first paper I looked at, I found reference to the Great Reset Conspiracy Theory. And in the same paper, I find a very odd or even childish practice of referring to the pandemic in quotation marks as if they're being sarcastic. In fact, I do find several examples in this journal of sentences that some people might consider to be quite conspiratorial. For example, this sentence here, which questions whether the pandemic itself was actually fashioned by a group of people who were also fashioning the narrative. Obviously balmy nonsense. Now, quite why Dr. John Campbell would choose to cover a paper from this journal, I have no idea, but the question still remains. How did these bits of microplastic, perhaps, get inside the solutions? Now, I will say that nobody in the world has ever replicated these results. But if I am to take the paper at face value and not just discard it as being some kind of mistake or even worse, if I am to assume that these things were actually in those solutions, then how might they have got there? Well, the materials and methods section does tell us that 50 of the 54 vials included in this study had already been used. In other words, syringes had pushed in and out of that rubber seal several times over before the residual solution left was added to culture and incubated. We were told that the solution was mixed with various chemicals, including those containing crystals. And then they were popped into these rather dirty, manky looking plastic containers here. Oh, and I should add, just because, you know, it's funny, that they took these, <laughs> they took these containers and they decided to just pop them on top of a mobile phone to see whether 5G would activate something. It's, I, it's ridiculous. But at least John Campbell has brought this paper to our attention, so we could all have a good laugh at it. Thanks, John. Now, this video does seem to be coming under some criticism online, and as this Twitter user points out here, part of the materials and methods section also involved incubating the solution for over a year. Now, when you incubate water for so long, you can get, you know, various nanoparticles and colloids that are in that solution anyway, uh, aggregating together to form visible structures, especially with changes in temperature, which was certainly involved in this investigation, or changes in pH. All in all, this paper is an absolute car crash. So ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, what is more likely? Is it more likely that the objects you see on screen, if they did indeed appear in these solutions, is it more likely that they are a range of microplastics, crystals, and a bacteriophage, plus a range of nanoparticles and colloids which have aggregated together, which we would expect to see in water that have been incubated over a 12-month period? Or is it more likely that the... Authors of a paper that appeared in a journal which references conspiracy theories like the Great Reset and uses the word pandemic in quotation marks, is it more likely that they, on their own, are the first people ever <laughs> to find some self-assembling nanotechnology, something that nobody else in the world has been able to replicate, and they did it 
by basically just putting some stuff on top of a mobile phone. Now, what I will say is, come to your own conclusions on that and let me know in the comments. For now, it's only right that we give proper credit to the uh, the authors and the journal. After all, we have been using some of their work, which they do allow as long as credit is given. So I will allow John Campbell to have the final word and credit the authors for me. For now, hit that subscribe button. I'm out. Goodbye. The International Journey of Journal of Theory, Practice and Research is a peer-reviewed, scholarly, open access journal. All content is freely available without charge to the user or his, her institution, which of course is excellent. Users may read, download, copy, distribute, print, search or link the full text of articles or use them for any other lawful purpose. Permission is not required from the publisher nor from the author.